the uh, 13, 14, 15. Is that where we are now? 13, 14, 15? We were at 12, but I think it was 13, 14, and 15. They might be 19, 18. Uh, well, uh oh. Okay, we got We one. have a pilot already. Uh -oh. All right? Because what we go through for the next 13 chapters is um, the qualities of the gods derived, pulled out of each of the dialogues. That's nice. We get hey, wait, here. Fun, fun, here. Fun, fun, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Come on, no, let's see. Oh, yeah. 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 What, what I, what I, what I you got, got you just got. <laughs> you got it already. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> it's not bad to get a conclusion like that. No, it's not. <laughs> yeah. I also have here some uh, okay. university pamphlets. Yeah. The graduate schools of education and psychology, the ones that are not affiliated with uh, universities, professional schools. They're up here if anyone would like to see them. Why do you got those? I was just given them. Oh. We tried to pawn them off on somebody else. Yes. Okay. okay. That makes sense. Um, but if Cam's got the laws worked out, correct? Right. Yeah. Thank you. Go ahead. This is the first example of the principles pulled out from the, on, about the gods from the different texts. There's a three here. Did someone leave this up here by accident? My finger is already in it. No, it's a lot of uh, All right, all right. I just want to make sure if someone doesn't come up here and say, you know, wait, whatever they're doing. And they're gone. <laughs> Maybe we should stop and read the laws at this point. No. Well, not the whole laws, anyway. Why not? We would finish that digression in about uh, 1990, and then we would come back to Chronicles. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in Book 10 of the laws, uh, Plato discusses uh, providence. And Proclus makes reference to it in book, in chapter 13. Page 40. This again is that before knowledge. Yeah, <laughs> pro news. in the laws and contemplate how they take the lead with respect to the truth about the gods and are the most ancient of all the other mystic conceptions about a divine nature. Um, in book 10 of the laws, They consider that people who do impious acts either do not believe that there are gods, or if they believe there are gods, they believe that the gods do not uh, care about us. And finally, if they do care about us, uh, that they can be appeased by sacrifices. And so go ahead and do what you want and then make the proper sacrifice. And so Plato undertakes to uh, discuss these three things and Proclus points them out. <coughs> three things, therefore, are asserted by Plato in these writings. That there are gods, that their providence 
extends to all things, and that they administer all things according to justice, and suffer no perversion from worse natures. And this last would mean that you cannot make appeasements for unjust acts with uh, uh, sacrifice to cause them to go along with injustice. Now these three things are discussed in chapter 13, 14, and 15, one chapter apiece. So chapter 13 will be a discussion of that there are God. And we're, we've been following in the Parmenides' second hypothesis uh, and now we're up to the discussion of uh, motion. Now I personally, I don't see, I know that the argument that there are gods going to have to do with motion and with order and uh, but I, I haven't been able to really pin it down in the Parmenides uh, but that section would be involved uh, <coughs> So that's why I spoke up and said 13, 14, and 15 makes a natural unit. Because he says he's going to discuss three things, and he does so in these three chapters. They also discuss each of these in the laws in book 10. Uh, What did you say was 14 and 15? I got 13 because that there are gods. 14 is that their providence extends to all things. Mm -hmm. And 15 is uh, that they administer all things according to justice and suffer no perversion okay. from worse natures. So that, uh, and there's... Those three points then are respectively... Yeah. And you will find similar discussions in the laws in Book 10 uh, to each of those three points. Uh, now, that there are gods Can be of a more leading nature than the hypothesis of the gods, or than boniform providence, or immutable and undeviating power, through which they produce secondary natures uniformly, preserve, them, preserve themselves in an undefiled manner, and convert them to themselves. But the gods indeed govern all things but suffer nothing from subordinate natures, nor are changed with the variety of things to which their providence extends. We shall learn, however, how these things are defined according to nature if we endeavor to embrace by a reasoning process the scientific method of Plato about each of them. And prior to these, survey by what <coughs> irrefragable arguments he proves that their are gods, and thus afterwards consider such problems as are conjoined with this dogma. 
of all being. I'm sorry. Okay. Bottom of page 40. I don't understand. You explained that before, Ken, but I don't understand it. The gods and thieves govern other things, but suffer nothing from subordinate natures. Mm-hmm. <coughs> what don't you, don't you understand about it? What is it they do not suffer? Nothing. <laughs> There's nothing that you suffer. They said that they do not suffer. What is it they do not suffer? Suffering. Oh, come on. <laughs> yeah. It's the suffering of the suffering. Everything that is contrary to their nature. Yeah, right. That, that, that was high rhetoric. Um... <laughs> When I say to suffer nothing, it means that there isn't anything that they suffer from subordinate nature. What does the word suffer mean uh, in this context? Uh, receive. <coughs> receive. Uh, be affected. Be affected by. Change in some way. Okay. See. I'm using this little picture here. Uh, the gods produce secondary natures and convert them to themselves. In producing the secondary natures, the secondary natures suffer goodness from the gods. They suffer well. goodness. <laughs> 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 or, or, uh, are affected by this bonnie form uh, covenant. But the gods suffer nothing from from the secondary nature. Okay, so it comes down within the gods. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Huh? Did you have I was just going to add, when it says they produce secondary natures uniformly and preserve themselves in an undefiled manner and mm-hmm. convert them to themselves, I think that if you also look at that notion of preserving themselves in an undefined way, you follow that up with, right? mm-hmm. because what would that mean that, that they're undefined? Yeah. Right? And then, yeah. Do you see it? Then how you follow that? Um, if secondary inches are converted back, they aren't secondary, they're converted back. And so it, that, it, that he considers it necessary to say they suffer nothing, meaning that in that conversion back, they do not then Participate of the secondariness of the secondary nature. Ah, very good. Uh-huh. Is that your favorite? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's a pop. Yeah. When yeah. they're converted back, the secondariness doesn't, doesn't rub off. Rub off. I don't know. Okay. I was seeing that, that order. Mm-hmm. Well, that Because I suppose by making sacrifices for the appeasement of the gods could could uh, be involved suffering and perversion. But that would be by the secondary nature. Yeah, but since they suffer nothing from the secondary nature, they can suffer no perversion from the secondary nature. Um, now we're coming to the irrefragable argument. What is that word? Franco, 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 You see? You break up. <laughs> adamantine. It means adamantine. It means it won't be broken. It won't be broken up. It's tough. How far are you? These are tough. Here we go. 
there's an alternate form of Frego, 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 Frego. <laughs> Does that mean there's a sequence that can't be altered to? Is that related to Yeah, that's nothing about that. Is that related to us? Uh, Tutable? Is that related <laughs> to Tutable? Is Fragable <laughs> related to Tutable? So that there's irrefutable and irrefragable? Yeah. It's fragable. Why not? It's a chocolate. It's a chocolate. Okay. Of all being no. Okay. <coughs> Of all beings, therefore, it is necessary that some should move only, but that others should be moved only, and that the nature situated between these should both move and be moved. Should I wait till you get these? No, go ahead. Here. And with respect to these last, it is necessary <coughs> either that they should move others being themselves moved by others, or that they should be self-moved. Uh -huh. These four hypostases, likewise, are necessarily placed in an order orderly series, one after another. That which is moved only and suffers, depending on <coughs> the prime, the, sorry, that which is moved only and suffers, depending on other primary causes. That's one. Two, that which moves others and is at the same time moved, being prior to this. Three, that which is self motive and which is beyond that which both moves and is moved, beginning from itself and through its own motion imparting the representation of being moved to other things. And that which is immovable, preceding whatever participates, either producing or passive motion. So we got five levels. Right? <coughs> four. I have four here, what do you say that four? The top moves only? No. But is immovable? Yeah. Self moving and moves others? Well, moved by, not, by another and moves others? Are you saying that one there is one category, that which moves is also immovable? It moves only, but it's itself is immovable. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, it imparts movement without moving? Yes. And self-moving and moves others Moved by another and moves others, and only move. Uh, now the question that we want to, or the theme we want to bear in mind, is how this breaking down things into these categories of movement is going to relate to uh, the existence, proof of the existence of gods. Uh, okay. For everything self-motive, <coughs> in, con in consequence of possessing its perfection in a transition and interval of life depends on another more ancient cause which always subsists according to sameness and in a similar manner in a similar manner and whose life is not in time but in eternity for time is an image of eternity mm-hmm
Um, <coughs> so from two down are in time but as I understand it the first which moves only and is immovable is in eternity uh, Anything with a soul is self-moving. And can uh, both move itself and move others. Uh, this body uh, is not self-moving in itself, but is moved by uh, the movement of the soul. And but once it moves, it can cause other things to move. And some things are only moved for the rocks. Other rocks, I suppose. <laughs> Although some rocks could cause things to move if they rolled in the right way. So the only one that's not in time is number one. That's as I understand it. I just want to ask you about number one. You said move only, immovable. Yeah. Where do you get immovable from? Uh, it moves others, but it doesn't move itself. It itself doesn't move. Said, Where did we get him over? It said it moved, moved only and suffered. Oh, they were in the very reverse order. Correct. You see, starting from the bottom, working on the reading oh, list. They went first order. Oh, oh immovable is the fourth one. All right, right. Fourth, okay. That. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sorry. I, I got it back. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I put them in reverse okay. order. I'm glad you pointed that out. That's right. Okay. Did I tell you? Because I wanted to have the highest, at the okay. highest part of the blackboard. I'm sorry, I didn't follow it. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So when you're talking about the soul body or whatever, and what is number one of them, is that the more? And uh, what was the last? Is that the analog? Could be. Mm -hmm. We'll see what he says. Mm -hmm. Well, you were telling us the other mm -hmm. one, but I thought maybe you were going to tell us that one. <laughs> 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 Could you just make one other thing, sir? Is there a distinction between primary and secondary the mm -hmm. primary causes mm -hmm. number four or number one would be move only mm -hmm. depending on other primary causes uh, causes mm -hmm. prior to it and some other cause uh, but even the body and this wouldn't be sufficient the body has to be moved by the self-moving soul uh, 
that's how I understand the bit about primary causes. It might be that if he drops this rock, it could cause another one to move. Uh, that would be more like a secondary cause. Uh, when we consider motion, uh, Plato, particularly in the laws, takes motion all the way to the motion of the heavens. In fact, uh, one of the beautiful ways to think about motion is to think of the motion of the heavens, the idea that certain things move, but they have an order to them, uh, displaying some intelligence. Uh, so, I'd like to read on a little bit more and see what, how process goes with this. <laughs> if, therefore, all things which are moved by themselves are moved according to time, but the eternal form of motion is above that which is carried in time, the self-motive nature will be second in order and not the first of beings. Mm -hmm. but that which moves others and is moved by others must necessarily be suspended from a self-motive nature mm -hmm. and not this alone but likewise every alter motive fabrication as the Athenian guest demonstrates and there I believe he's making reference to a portion of the laws. Uh. Okay. For of all things, says he, should stand still, unless self-motive natures had a substance, subsistence among things there would be no such thing as that which is first moved. For that which is immovable is by no means naturally adapted to be moved, nor will there then be that which is first moved. But the alter motive nature is <coughs> indigent of another moving power. <coughs> Okay. The self-motive nature, therefore, alone, as beginning from its own energy, will move both itself and others in a secondary manner. Uh, the body alone is alter-motive. <coughs> the body alone won't bring about movement, but depends on the self-motive <coughs> nature, which alone can uh, initiate For a thing of this kind imparts the power of being moved to alter motive natures in the same manner as an immovable nature imparts a motive power to all beings. Mm -hmm. oh. The relationship between one and two and two and three is the same. Is that right? Who's making an analogy? One is to two, is two is to three. <coughs> One imparts power to two, two to three, in the same manner. But it's to all beings. Mm -hmm. And from there, to yeah. In the third place, that which is moved only must first of all be suspended from things moved by another, 
but moving others. For it is necessary both that other things and the series of things move, which extends in an orderly manner <coughs> from on high to the last of things, should be filled with their proper media. So that's another reason for inverting that order. So we come from on high to the last of things, winding up with what is moved only. Um, looking for how this is going to give us gods. Uh, and what are the gods in the system? Okay. Mm -hmm. So, could you go back to uh, page 41? Yeah. yeah. The second line in that last paragraph. But the eternal form of motion mm -hmm. is above that, which is carried in time. Mm -hmm. But the eternal form of motion. What, what time? If therefore all things which are moved by themselves are moved according to time, but the eternal form of motion is above that, which is carried in time. It's not even felt moving. Um. Yeah. Oh yes. Eternal form of motion, independent or transcending time. You see that he drives up and the thing in dust is up there in the same. I uh, no, I didn't. It may be. It may be that when we look at the laws, uh, uh, there would be something about the eternal form of motion. The part about the Athenian guests had to do with self motive and alter motive. Who are the candidates for the Athenian guests? Who are the candidates for the Athenian guests? Do you take it to be the laws? I, I take him to be talking about the laws and the demonstration in Book 10. That demonstration. Then that also be the sophist? No, he'd be the Elaine. The, 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 the Elaine, wouldn't he? Yeah. He's a guest where? Huh? The Elaine is a guest like in, he's in a stranger from Elaine. He's a stranger. Yeah. In question, uh, the old question was, was he a stranger to Elaine? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes, he probably was. But... Yeah, he'd be a guest if he was from somewhere else. From, yeah. He was the yeah. 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 But in any case, there's an eternal form of motion, right, which is above that, which is carried in time. I think the likely candidate would probably be the laws of the tech on this list. I don't know if we're calling discussion about all the mode and self mode and the soft mode. Do you? What there is, he does regard, one of the sophist arguments is that he does regard both motion, motion and rest independent. Of being. 
Yeah. Right. And separate, and therefore above time, above the, I mean, above uh, realm of time. Yeah. This is got me. Yeah. I'm only on book four, yeah. six on the laws right now. I haven't gotten to this discussion yet. So I'll keep an eye out for it. But since these three chapters are on the laws, I would. Yeah. Mm-hmm. How can you have motion without time? So it's the eternal form of motion. That's the very point. <coughs> yeah. How can they reach that to him? Yeah, that's the very point. The other point is, Presumably, this is also on the second hypothesis, is it not? That's what we're doing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there, there is, must. There, is there a form of time independent? Pardon me. Is there a form of motion independent of time? The second hypothesis. Is there an understanding? I haven't seen it. Well, that's what it would indicate here with that statement. Yeah. That the eternal form of motion is above that which is carried in time. Either that statement doesn't make any sense. Or that there has to be an internal form of motion in the second hypothesis. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, so there, well, maybe the suggestion is it's not in relationship to the second hypothesis, but the book kind of Oh, okay. But then where are we going to locate it? Well, so we have to look this. Oh, it's certainly not in the things that move themselves, right? No, self move. It, it's not there. It because it's not in time. Yeah, it's higher than that, right? But the eternal mo- form of motion is above that which is carried in time. Mm-hmm. It's not in the second order. The other point is that uh, in that third paragraph, same page, you must be using the term beings in a more general way <laughs> of all beings. That's certainly not so on. Is that page 41? Yeah. Well, that would include existence. Then. The first paragraph. Could you repeat that a little louder? Well, he's, he's well, usually, when they use the word being, they usually mean like with a capital B, right. the element of being. But clearly, here's a... And in this work, he always he has been spending some time talking about the genera of being. Class of being, how it comes into existence, how it, how it can be said to be. Mm-hmm. And then here he has a concept of being that includes these four divisions, which are not in the normally accepted realm of being. Yeah, that's strange. Uh, this, um, sorry, there's a, another point on this motion time thing. The way he understands the conclusions in the hypotheses, remember, is that they that they unfold. And the argument for motion precedes the argument for time in the second. The so motion is a higher, um, it's more prior than time, but his understanding. Isn't it the form of motion? Because it's in another, it's in motion. Right. That's right. Right, so it's, uh, the argument for time follows later on. So he could have a time that is prior, that would be, it motion would be altered motion, after motion. Right. 
Uh, yeah. Yes, equally well, you could raise the question of whether or not there's a form of time, because motion is motion is presumed to exist in the second hypothesis. Yeah. Well, it's demonstrated. Pardon? It's derived. Derived. Well, yeah. It's not as if there is a form called motion that exists independently. It comes into... You mean like floating around? Or? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Wait, it's like an intrinsic... Uh, it's an intrinsic quality of being. Yeah. being. Yeah, it's an intrinsic yeah. quality of being. At so, some level or some... Uh, yeah. some yeah. Therefore, to talk about it as a separate form is not in the second hypothesis. Um, as a cause. As a cause. Not as a cause, but as or as a cause. And he sees all of those as causes. Each conclusion is a cause. Now, gods are causes. Each conclusion is a god. So this the motion would be a cause. This motion, that state would be a cause. But if I'm understanding correctly. I, I don't know what you're saying. I'm saying something different. I'm saying the way this work is approaching the subject is talking about the independent existence of a form called motion. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I'm saying that's not in the second analysis. Because any number of forms, including the form of motion, doesn't come together to produce, as it were, being. Because motion is implicit in the second hypothesis from the beginning. Um, yeah, it's, it's implicit in it. The mm -hmm. um, question is, does, is, is there something more uh, uh, prim primary in the second than motion? Yes, that's what which would mean that there is a hierarchy and then motion would be at a distance from some primary principle or state. Therefore, therefore motion wouldn't exist as a primary form no. operating independently. No, not Which independently. is the way this is structured. Oh, I see what you... Uh, Even though it's there, it wouldn't be primary there because didn't he have levels within being? Could, could you say that... Could you say that... Yeah form of motion that would be like you could take it as being the thing and then you have this this thing that moves through time which is like inside of the whole the whole thing that is the form of motion so it would be secondary because it's moving through it It is because you have the motion through time rather than just the form of it. You know, um, that, I, I you don't know, know whether you have this section in mind or not. Do you, you have, have it? Do you have that section in mind on yeah. page 41? Because you know. what you're proposing isn't there. Pick another one. Well, it's hard for me to think of motion not in time. Mm -hmm. well, yeah. form of the idea of motion itself. <coughs> See, it makes it interesting that, that this is an idea in the sense. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. What are you saying? The idea of motion. <coughs> not motion itself, yeah. but the idea of motion. Yes, the idea of motion and the idea of rest independent of being in the sophist. Mm -hmm. The sophist is an Athenian guest. Yeah, but the, in the sophist, he refers to him on page 32 as the Hellenian guest. Hmm. Now, it's possible that he could call calling the Athenian guest. Well, the point is, it, it isn't important mm -hmm. to, the, to this statement. Mm -hmm. It's very likely when we get from book 10 of the Lord, you may in fact be able to discover this. Mm -hmm. The only relevant point I'm making here is 
that if this is still talking about the realm of being, it's a rather strange way of talking about the realm of being mm -hmm. for the following reasons. On page 48, when it says, in respect to all beings, mm -hmm. that isn't the kind of realm of beings, plural, that you find in the second hypothesis. No. It involves sure. things that are outside of it. Right. right. In the following paragraph, with this idea of an eternal form of motion, mm -hmm. as being itself a significant element in, in the development of the second hypothesis, that isn't there either. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? So I just wanted to highlight that as we're going. So, mm -hmm. yeah. so, you know, they could be the word for form there is Eidos. It could just be using a species of here, a kind, you know. Um, again, those Eidos, you know, being a species. Yeah. Um, that may be the way he's translated, because you know, he, he could use morphe quite easily for form or schema for form, you know, and want to be specific about shape and boundary. I have to look at that to see how he's in. Yeah, well, in any case, it has to fit what came, which comes before it. Well, the category beforehand is all things which are moved by themselves. Are moved according to time. Right, and that's the number two on the yeah. blackboard. Right. right. Mm -hmm. And then he's making an exception. Mm -hmm. But is something... Is above it, right? right. Mm -hmm. So the above first that thing. has to be something called the eternal blah 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 yeah. of motion, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. yeah. right, the blah, blah, blah. form or scheme of right. that motion which is eternal. Right. Right. Kind of of into motion and in eternity. And it would have to be among the first of beings, wouldn't it? By that same thing, and not well, this is yeah, the problem. And That's not the, the point I'm raising. Yeah, yeah, right. right. <coughs> It's not the second order, but the first order. Yeah. Okay, that's charged. Huh? Okay. Unless anyone wants to continue. <coughs> so we were at... I, I don't know. If, I, I think I still have it as a question. You want to pass here. it? Go on. Probably should read the last sentence of the preceding paragraph. Okay. okay. <coughs> For it is necessary both that other things and the series of things move, which extends in an orderly manner from on high to the last of things, should be filled with their proper meaning. All bodies, therefore, belong to those things which are naturally moved only and are passive. For they are productive of nothing on account of possessing an, an hypostasis endued with interval and participating of magnitude and bulk. Since everything productive and motive <coughs> of others naturally produces and moves, since everything productive and motive of others naturally produces and moves by employing an incorporeal power. But of incorporeal natures, some are divisible <coughs> about bodies, but others are exempt from such a division about the last of things. Those incorporeals, therefore, which are divisible about the bulks of bodies, whether they subsist in qualities or in material forms, belong to the number of things moved by another, but at the same time moving others. For these, because they possess an incorporeal allotment, participate, in, participate of a motive power. But because they are divided about bodies, are deprived of the power of verging to themselves, are divided together with their subjects, and are full of sluggish, sluggishness from these. They are an indigent of a motive nature which is not born along in a foreign seat, but possesses an hypostasis in itself. Now remember that one of the 
um, key terms with prophets is this conversion. Uh, turning back on yourself and therefore turning back toward the higher soul, the intelligent, and the one. And whatever is divisible about bodies cannot do this, can deprive of the power of virgin. Uh, because uh, if even if I put all the fingers on the right hand onto the left hand, I still have to get the fingers of the right hand back to touch the fingers of the right hand. You can't uh, convert one to one all parts of the body to, to all parts of the body. Well, that's the problem of seeing the whole body at once. The problem of uh, of uh, converting itself, seeing it all at once, and not seeing it. Why? Remember when we discussed it? You, you never see your whole body at once. Whole, anything. Uh huh. Yeah, I see the So, the corporeal, merely, is this fourth category, moved only. The incorporeal, he has divided into those which are divisible about bodies, the third category, and those of which are not divisible. And I jumped in to mention that uh, that which is divisible about bodies cannot convert. And that was one of our ideas that we've been following. Uh, go on, please. Where, therefore, shall we obtain that which moves itself? For things extended into natures possessing bulk and interval, or which are divided in these and subsist inseparably about them, must necessarily either be moved only or be motive through others. But it is necessary, as we have before observed, that a self-motive nature should be prior to these, which is perfectly established in itself and not in others, and which fixes its energies in itself and not in things different from itself. There is, therefore, another certain nature exempt from bodies, both in the heavens and in these very mutable elements, from which bodies primarily derive the power of being moved. Hence, if it be requisite to discover what such an essence as this is, rightly following Socrates and considering what the end of things is. That's what we see, that essence there, and perfectly mm -hmm. established in themselves, that's what we see. So I can give you those in the way through if you want. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if you just go back uh, a bit more to the other page, mm -hmm. a lot of papers is, which is perfectly established in itself, mm -hmm. five lines up. Yeah, which is perfectly established. Established is the form of the seal. Yeah. And not in others, and which fixes its energies in itself, and not in things different from itself. There is, therefore, another certain nature exempt from bodies, both in the heavens and these very mutable elements, from which body primarily derives the power of being moved. Hence, it would be requisite to discover what such an essence as this is, rightly following Socrates and considering what the end of things is, which by being present to all motive natures, imparts to them a representation of self-motion, to which, to which of the above-mentioned nature shall we ascribe the power of things being moved? from themselves. To which? To which of the above mentioned nature shall we describe the power of things being moved from themselves? Mm -hmm. For all inanimate natures are alone alter motive, and whatever they suffer, they are adapted to suffer through a certain power externally moving and compelling. It remains, therefore, that animated natures must possess this representation, and that they are self-motive in a secondary degree, but that the soul which is in them primarily moves itself and is moved by itself, and that through a power derived from itself as it imparts life to bodies, 
and that through a power derived from itself, as it imparts life to bodies. So likewise, it extends to them from itself a representation of being moved by themselves. So the body looks like it's moved by itself, but it is the soul which imparts life to the bodies and gives a representation to them of being self-moved. The bodies themselves cannot move unless they are animated by the soul. thinking about souls moving humans around and we're going to see whether he expands this uh, to take in other other things other than just human when you say humans you mean the human body yeah human bodies yeah. I mean like the planets or the earth or the sun perhaps yeah Okay. You see? <coughs> if there uh, just for a second. Mm-hmm. On page forty three. Mm-hmm. Uh, how do you understand the uh, representation? Keep turning that paragraph, you agree? Yeah. Parts of the representation. Copy. Uh <laughs> I took that to mean it looks as if the bodies move themselves, but they actually are moved by the soul. I think it should be coffee, but I'll check it. Yeah. yeah. Let's introduce first on page 41. differently? Yeah, but how can the body be self-motive in a secondary <coughs> degree? How can it be self-motive at all? That's Where does it say that they are? In that same page 43, it remains therefore that animated natures in, yeah, animated. must possess this representation and that they are self-motive in a secondary degree but that the soul which is in them primarily moves itself and is moved by itself and that through a power derived from itself as it imparts life to bodies so likewise it extends to them from itself a representation of being moved by themselves well <coughs> I, uh, <coughs> We see the bodies move, uh, apparently by themselves. Um, See, the word representation is there three times in that paragraph. 
a representation of self function. Now, uh, that would be good if we had the Greek on that. Uh, just, I just said the appearance of self function. Yeah. But maybe uh, somebody else. Huh? Yeah. Um, if you take that idea, would you just say in the last phrase from the word so and tell me what you see? Mm -hmm. So likewise, mm -hmm. it extends to them, the soul extends to bodies from itself a representation of being moved by themselves. So likewise, that's kind of logical. So as it extends life to the body, it extends to them a representation of being moved. additional quality, isn't it? Uh -huh. Right, it imparts life to the body. Right, so the likewise, right. so likewise, mm -hmm. it extends, it extends to them from itself, now that's because the structure in the same yes. parallel as the preceding and mm -hmm. that, it doesn't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A representation of being moved by themselves. Mm -hmm. That would be analogous to us in parts like the body. Mm -hmm. Mm use of representation consistent with that on page 41? Yeah, I was talking about that. Because the, there seems, you seem to be saying that there is a, an orderly series, one after another. <coughs> and the third one is that uh, that which is self-motive and which is beyond that which both moves and is moved, beginning from itself and through its own motion imparting the representation of being moved to other things. Yeah, see, it's, it's, uh, it's the process going on, mm -hmm. and it, it's imparted. Mm -hmm.
table or table there. Mm -hmm. If therefore the self motive essence is more ancient than ultra motive nature, but soul is primarily self motive, from which the image of self motion is imparted to bodies, soul will be beyond bodies, and the motion of every body will be the progeny of the soul and of the motion it contains. Hence it is necessary that the whole heaven and all the bodies it contains, possessing various motions, and being, and being moved <coughs> with these different motions, according to nature, for a circulation is natural to everybody at this time, should have ruling souls, which are essentially more ancient than bodies, and which are moved in themselves, and su <coughs> supernally illuminate these with the power of being moved. It is necessary, therefore, that these souls which dispose in an orderly manner the whole world and the parts it contains, and who impart to everything corporeal which is of itself destitute of life, the power of being moved, inspiring it for this purpose, with the cause of motion, should either move all things <coughs> conformably to reason, or after a contrary manner, which it is not lawful to assert. Mm -hmm. But if indeed this world and everything in it, which is disposed in an orderly manner, and is moved equally and perpetually according to nature, as is demonstrated, partly in the mathematical dis disciplines and partly in physical dis discussions, is suspended from an irrational soul, which moving itself moves also other things, neither the order of the periods nor the motion which is bounded by one reason nor the position of bodies, nor any other of those things which are generated according to nature, will have a stable cause <coughs> and which is able to distribute everything in an orderly manner and according to an invariable sameness of subsistence. So he jumps to the heavens and the order that we can see in the heavens here I've drawn a lovely picture of Orion and the moon. The two things I can recognize most easily in the morning. <laughs> and uh, <coughs> the whole, where this arrow goes, we can imagine the whole zodiac belt and the whole constellation revolving, circular motion. And there's this marvelous order to be observed. And from this argument, if something is to be moved, it can't be moved if all there are is just bodies. Because they need a prior cause. <laughs> Even if they're alter motive, if everything was only alter motive, there could be no uh, other no self mover to move all these alter motive natures. So there must be some self moving uh, nature to bring about the first movement. And this nature is the soul. And so in the, in the laws, we find Plato talking about the movement in the heavens, the order in the heavens, and the and the uh, the soul uh, souls responsible for this orderly movement. Uh, we have a while to go. He doesn't actually conclude this argument until we get over to page 47 at the bottom. Uh, but uh, we have made a distinction of these categories of movement and pointed out that souls 
must exist beyond bodies uh, so that there be something self-moving so that there could be motion at all. And since there is a continual motion in the heavens, then there must be souls guiding this motion. Uh, and well, rational. They must be rational. It can't be irrational. Or we wouldn't... If it was irrational, Orion would look one way one night and another another night. And however, this irrational soul happened to want the book. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, he, uh, now comes up with the intellectual soul. Everything irrational is naturally adapted <coughs> to be adorned by something different from itself and is indefinite and unadorned in its own nature. But to commit all heaven to a thing of its kind and a circulation revolving according to reason and with an invariable sameness is by no means adapted either <coughs> to the nature of things or to our undisciplined conception. If, however, an intellectual soul, and which employs reason, governs all things, and if everything which is moved with a perpetual relation is governed by a soul of this kind, and there is no one of the wholes in the universe destitute of soul, for no body is honorable if deprived of such a power as this, as Theophrastus somewhere says, if this be the case, whether does it possess this intellectual, perfect, and beneficent power according to participation or according to essence? And that's who's seen it. There was one more before I was caught up. So now the question is whether this, if there is such an intellectual soul capable of maintaining the sameness of motion that we observe in heaven, uh, does it participate, does it have this intellectual power through participation or by essence? If it was by essence, then it would be a primary cause. You know what you mean there, Kim? Uh, In other words, sufficient within itself? I think so, yes. If it participated, it had to... It would have something higher than higher. itself. Yeah. For if, according to essence, it is necessary that every soul should be of this kind, since each according to its own nature is self-motive. But if according to participation, there will be, but if according to participation, there will be another intellect subsisting in energy, more ancient than the soul, which essentially possesses intellection, and by its very being pre-assumes in itself the uniform knowledge of wholes. Since it is also necessary that the soul which is essentialized according to reason 
to possess that which pertains to intellect through participation, and that the intellectual nature should be twofold, the one subsisting primarily in a divine intellect itself, but the other which proceeds from this subsisting secondarily in the soul. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> to which you may add, if you please, the presence of intellectual illumination in body. Not worth the presence, it's to see it. So. For <clears throat> whence is the whole of this heaven either spherical or moved in a circle? And whence does it revolve with a sameness of circulation according to one definite order? For how could it always be allotted the same idea and power immutably according to nature if it did not participate of specific formation according to intellect? For soul indeed is the supplier of motion, but the cause of a firm establishment and that which reduces the unstable mutation of things that are moved into sameness and also a life which is bounded by one reason and a circulation which subsists with invariable sameness <coughs> will evidently be superior to soul. So, <coughs> uh, when we look at the heavens, marvel at the invariable sameness uh, in the revolution. Uh, though the self-moving power of the soul moves it, the sameness of the pattern is due to the intellect which is beyond the soul, which the soul participates in. That's what he means by cause of a firm establishment. Yeah. And this argument, we find, or at least a similar argument, is found in the laws. The argument about that there are gods. See, 34. body therefore and the whole of this sensible nature belongs to things which are ultimate mm-hmm. but soul is self motive binding in itself all corporeal motion and prior to this is intellect which is immovable okay. let no one however suppose that I assert this immobility of intellect to resemble that which is sluggish, destitute of life, and without respiration, but that it is the leading cause of all motion, and the fountain, if you are willing to, <coughs> willing so to denominate it, of all life, both of that which is converted to itself, and of that which has its hypostasis in other things. And with the fountain image, <laughs> We bring back that model of the overflowing from the intellect to the soul. The soul we already saw in parts life to the body. Now the intellect, which is immovable, is said to be the fountain, as it were, of all life. Through these causes also, the world is denominated by Timaeus. An animal endued with soul and intellect. 
being called by him an animal according to its own nature, and the life pervading to it from soul, and which is distributed about it, but animated or endued with soul, according to the presence of the divine soul in it, and endued with intellect, according to intellectual domination. Is that word endued, or is that a misprint for endued? Is that is that a uh, e n d u e d or should that be yes? What does that mean? What's the people? Yeah. 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 But it ha- means that doesn't it mean that it has to get it from something else? And it says endued with soul. I thought it looked kind of that way. Maybe that. You mean like it carries that meaning all the way? Right. Right. So the supply of life, the government of soul and the participation of intellect connect and contain the whole of heaven. Hmm. Uh, there was a pre- there was a, a presence two lines up there. It says, according to presence of, uh, of a divine soul, that presence is a form of the seer. Anybody? Mm. Is that part of the I guess it is. I, well, the, other, the other form of the CA you were talking about earlier. Well, it may be the same. That would be 64, 66 four by just about that. Because there's another one coming up too. Here. Oh, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not Uh-huh. What do you think God got space when he was creating the universe? <laughs> <laughs> hmm. I don't know. He certainly needed it. Yeah. yeah. Because you couldn't have more than one thing without it. Yeah. We'd all run together, Paul, and that would be acceptable. <laughs> <laughs> the reason I ask about that part of the is because in the public, par is often is, is used for like the presence of the good. Mm-hmm. Par of Sia would be a noun formed off of that, mm-hmm. one of the forms of that verb. So there might be some reason for mm-hmm. translating it presence of, because par of, right? He does do that a lot with the presence here, focus. And the Taylor translates a part of see a lot like that. Mm-hmm. I think you see it. It plays off you know, from another. There's a handful of them. You have, you're right. That's not. I've probably seen it too. That's why it's significant. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it would have been something like that.
on this next line, uh, I mean, uh, uh, it's Timaeus there in the English, but the Greek manuscript we're working off it says Parmenides, and the quote seems to be Parmenides. So, <laughs> right? <laughs> what page are you on there? Uh, it's page 45 here. No, no, I mean. The Greek would be 66.4. That's too funny. Not the first quote of Tim we just read. There was another one coming up right here in the next one. 66.4. You'll see. If, however. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. So I don't know what... Uh, what uh, Taylor was working off of it, but that quote seems to be out of the quote. That intellect is the same as intellect, and if you look at the Greek, I think it's for to think is the same as to be. <laughs> oh no. Essentially, yeah. as uh, they're seeing. But essentially, intellect there, as we see right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah we're into a. <laughs> there were a few more back on the page before here that I uh, didn't have time to squeeze in if you want to take them out. Essentially. goes to 47. And then he uh, takes up that the gods providentially attend at once to holes and parts. And which leads us into chapter 14. There was a lot of reading for tonight, so we didn't get all the way through chapter 13. Uh, and I think now that we've put this, we've done what we've done, I can see a little bit more, as I read this prophet, the part I had the most difficulty with was this part. Uh, the part that has to do with whether the gods would be providential is a little easier to follow. And uh, uh, what, 
we we have to conclude it. Uh, and you can see that he makes these distinctions about different kinds of motion to set up something about the whole universe and the heavens and the world and the order in the world. You could, I think you could equally talk about the order. Uh, uh, he takes it to the level of the order of, you know, <coughs> that you can see in the heavens. I think you can probably reflect on the order in plants and atoms. Uh, however, uh, in the laws, I believe the argument has to do with the heaven also. I would recommend uh, looking at that first part of Book Ten in the laws. <coughs> you you'll see a similar argument there with this argument here. Uh, so I would suggest that we stop, get coffee, and the next time carry on from where we are. Unless there was some further questions. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We will look next time, all right? Yeah, what kind of soul is it that's going to drive the heaven?